Amen? Amen. Amen. Appreciate the, uh, the worship team just reminding us of that, even as we enter what uh, we call Advent season, where we kind of make our way and celebrate the birth of our Savior. Um, oh, come, let us adore him. It's, it's so vitally important that those that have been saved by him, that we adore him. Amen? Amen. 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 This morning, we're going to be coming from the book of Matthew. We're going to be continuing in our, um, our series in the book of Matthew. Matthew chapter 20, verses 1. Matthew chapter 20, verses 1 through 34. We'll be jumping into that today. Matthew chapter 20. And um, the title uh, for this morning's message is Last Place Ain't So Bad. Last Place Ain't So Bad. And I know I got some folks who are grammar people. Who, that's, yeah, that's not proper English. Well, this morning it is. So last place ain't so bad. And, uh, really around the theme of Jesus turns the world's wisdom upside down. Matthew chapter 20. Let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, for your mercy and your grace in our lives, your goodness, Father God. Your, Lord, even as we sit back and think about what mercy means and what it looks like for us, Father, we are, uh, we are um, prompted to pause and to think through. And Lord, we get a chance to, to see the kingdom of God this morning and how it operates, Father God. I pray that you use uh, this vessel for your honor, for your glory. Fill me with your Holy Spirit, Father God. I pray that you would arrest us where we're at in our seats. Lord, remove the distractions and anything that is not like you. And Lord God, replace it, Father God. I pray, Lord God, with an understanding of who you are, a better understanding of who you are, God. Uh, we need to hear from you this morning, God, as we live in this evil, fallen world, Father God. Amen. We need to hear about your kingdom and what you have called us to do and to be. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Last place ain't so bad. I just want to read uh, this parable, and then we'll jump in. Uh, Matthew chapter 20, verse 1 reads, For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire workers for his vineyard. He agreed to pay them a denarius for the day and sent them into his vineyard. About nine in the morning, he went out and saw others standing in the marketplace doing nothing. He told them, you also go and work in my vineyard and I will pay you whatever is right. So they went. He went out again about noon and about three in the afternoon and did the same thing about five in the afternoon. He went out and found still others standing around him. He asked them, why have you been standing here all day long doing nothing? Because no one has hired us, they answered. He said to them, you also go and work in my vineyard. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, call the workers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last one hired and go on to the first the workers who were hired about five in the afternoon came, and each one received a denarius. So when those came who were hired first, they expected to receive more. But each one of them also received a denarius. When they received it, they began to grumble against the landowner. These who were hired last worked only one hour, they said, and you have made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the work and the heat of the day. But he answered one of them, I am not being unfair to you, friend. Do didn't you agree to work for Daenerys? Take your pay and go. I want to give the one who was hired last the same as I gave you. Don't I have the right to do what I want with my own money? Or are you envious because I am generous? Amen. So the last will be first and the first will be last. Question for you this morning as we begin. Have you ever been last? Have you ever come in last? Have you ever been forgotten? Have you ever been working hard at something but not considered for your work? You and I both know the last person in line waits the longest. I can remember growing up playing basketball and football, and you know, when teams were selected around the way, uh, you never wanted to be the last guy to pick, right? You never wanted to be the last guy to pick, but there was relief that you were actually picked. Uh, you, but you, you went into the game, man, am I good enough? Do these people even like me? You know what? I think we're going to pick up my marbles and my ball and, and go home. <laughs> no, you played, but, but it was last, but you were still included within the game. Yeah. But what's great about the passage this morning is how often the least and the last or the servant, forgotten, the forgotten person is actually shown mercy 
and preferred. We'll see that throughout chapter 20. Man, his wonder is wild and it's, it's incredible as I read this passage, as you read on down through the Gospels, how Jesus prizes the last and the least because he describes that the kingdom of God is just like that. That's how the kingdom of God operates. And we are members of his kingdom. In this particular chapter, in chapter 20, we've had four events that we want to look at this morning. We've already read this parable, and it talks about the, the disgruntled workers. Um, then we're going to talk about someone willing to sacrifice. Then two brothers and, and a mom looking for a power play. And then lastly, two blind men with nothing to lose. And we hear about, as we go through this passage, we, Jesus talk about the kingdom of God, and he's teaching us something about himself and what it looks like to be a part of the kingdom. And so when you consider this parable that I just read, a parable is a big story. It's a story that's meant to convey something about God, something spiritual, something about how we ought to behave, right? And there are four characteristics as we consider uh, this parable. Number one, the kingdom of God is an opportunity to be blessed and to be shown mercy. Don't miss that. The kingdom of God is an opportunity to be blessed and be shown mercy. When you consider what has happened here, when you consider uh, this landowner who we'll be talking about first, the landowner was a benevolent landowner, right? Remember that the landowner, it is his land that needs work, and there is a harvest that needs to be picked. And Jesus communicates this parable to convey something to those who are hearing that, that there is work to be done, that there is room in the harvest field. Number two, remember also when we talk about even the landowner, this was his land, and there was something to be done, and he goes out and picks individuals to work the land, that there was work out there to be done. And so what does the landowner do? He goes out five times to pick up five sets of workers. He goes early in the morning at 9 a.m. He goes at 11 a.m., 3 p.m., 5 p.m. And there are individuals that he picks up who were out of work. Out of work. You know when you're out of work, how many people you've been, at one time or another, in your life you've been unemployed, and you know what that feels like. There's a sense of, man, you know what, if you want to pay me a denarii for a day, I'll work that. I'll do it. I'll do it. Yes, <laughs> you know I'll do it. <laughs> But the landowner shows mercy to these individuals by picking them up and by going out repeatedly throughout the day. And they say, yes, we agree to the terms that you have set out, one denarii per day. How's it going? I'm going to ignore that. And so five units, they all get the same thing. But there's a conflict. And where's that conflict? The conflict is between the 9 a.m. guys and the 5 p.m. guys. Because 9 a.m. guys are saying, our union contract says, no. Nah. You know there is no union contract in the kingdom of God. No, nah, it's, it's, it's working. And God assigns the work and he is sovereign over the work and so we have to understand that when we talk about the kingdom of God that the rules that we have here on earth with our job and how we go about doing things are not the same rules of the kingdom of God there's a difference there's a dichotomy uh, it, our, God's kingdom is not of this world it is it is unique and so we have to understand as believers first and foremost is that we are a part of God's kingdom we serve his kingdom first and not the world's because there is a difference but man, there are so many lessons in this passage about who God is. Because God is the landowner in this parable. A couple of things I just want to point out is this, that God will always honor his word to us. And you see that the landowner was true to his word. He said, I'm going to pay one denarii to each worker, no matter how, when you were hired and how much work you did, you get a denarii for the day. Number two, God is not unfair in his dealings with mankind. God is always fair, but if we want fair over grace, 
That's a whole different conversation. Number three, God has sovereign authority to do what he's decided to do with his creation. It's his field. It's his field. Remember that. The work is there, but it's his field. He is sovereign. And number four, God is extremely generous towards mankind. He loves to show mercy. As I was talking and looking through this passage, I was constantly thinking, man, what would you prefer? What would I prefer? Do I want fairness when it comes to God, or do I want mercy? Do I want fairness? Do I want to accuse God of being unfair? That God, that you didn't give me what I deserve. And sometimes we can get in that mindset, or would we rather have mercy? And see, the parable is talking about the fact that these dudes were out of work and God dropped by, the landowner dropped by and gave them a job and some pay for the day. And God was so gracious and merciful, he said, I'm going to give the guy who came in at 5 the same the guy, same the, uh, wage to the guy who came in at 9 a.m. That's incredible. Sometimes we, we got to get used to that. We've got to get... Uh, wrap our mind around that. We would rather, if we are understanding who God is and who we are and how we've come short yeah. so many times, and, and if we were to ever stand before righteous God and say to God, God, give me what's fair. Yeah. And God will look at us and roll the tape, push the VHS tape. I love the VHS tape in heaven, but the streaming video of our life, and we would see time and time again. Where if we actually got what we deserve, that we wouldn't be here. But God is so gracious and merciful that he showed mercy to each and every of these individuals that went out into uh, this vineyard. And he gave them something. He gave them work. He gave them dignity for that day so that they could go home and say, I've got a there. I was able to work. I was picked to work in the vineyard. And our attitude is so important as we consider this particular passage, as we consider what it means to exist within the kingdom of God. We ought to be uh, gracious and merciful to others. We ought to be uh, praising God for just the opportunity to work, whether we came in at 9 a.m. or whether we came in at 5. One of the things I would also say, it's not in my notes, but something that as I was studying this passage that I want to just say is that sometimes even as we consider the passage, the guys that came in at 9 a.m. grumbled at the guys who came in at 3 and 5 because they thought they deserved more. And sometimes, folks, we just need to mind our business. Sometimes we just need to take our eyes on what someone else is doing and thinking that I deserve more. I deserve to be in a higher status. I deserve more recognition. I deserve more. No, what you deserve and what you get are two different things. Sometimes we just, in the kingdom of God, we just need to rest in that we serve a merciful, gracious God who is generous and gave us an opportunity to work in the field. And sometimes we just need to take our mind, our eyes off of others and what they're doing and put them on Jesus. Put them on Jesus. It would solve a lot of problems. See, when we take our eyes off Jesus, we, we, we take in the world's kingdom mindset, the world's kingdom mindset. The world's kingdom is about consumption, more money, more prestige, more notoriety. Uh, the, 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 those who are in the world, they are ambitious. They seek to be served. They name job. They walk around with an entourage. They seek to make themselves famous and not God. See, God's kingdom is not this world's kingdom. And we, it is imperative that we understand that there is a difference between the two. Amen. See, see, God's kingdom, it is characterized by a reversal of the world's system. God's kingdom is the direct opposite of what the world is about. God's kingdom is characterized by mercy, by grace, by selflessness, by making God famous, forgiveness, hope, blessing others, not seeking to be blessed. 
So when Jesus says in verse number 16, so that the last will be first and the first will be last, understand that he is breaking with conventional wisdom. He is breaking with the world system, what they are about. What he's talking about is that it's not about the one who works the hardest, the fastest, the smartest, but the one who has he has mercy on and that he may run and, and, and do what the, 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 the landowner has called him to do. Just do what God called you to do in the time that he's called you to do it. See, we will be sitting right next to, we may have been saved at 8 years old and 10 years old. Guess who we'll be having lunch with when we get the glory? The God who said yes to Jesus on the cross. He was minutes or seconds away from losing his life, but he said yes to Jesus. Same mercy, same grace. And we'll exist, we'll enjoy it. See, the landowner knows it's his land. He gave the job. He walked by, came by, gave an example, like gave you the opportunity. And, and, and he is sovereign over the land and he is gracious. And I want to just encourage you to rest in God's mercy. Stop talking about fairness and what you have and what you don't have. Just get busy doing the work. Just be busy doing the work. Long that old, that, that, that same thing of first shall be last, last shall be first. And, and, and describing the kingdom of God is about selflessness and sacrifice and, and going above and beyond for someone else other than yourself. Jesus gives this example in verse number 17 through 19. He says, now Jesus was going up to Jerusalem on the way. He took the 12 aside and said to them, we are going up to Jerusalem and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the teachers of the law. They will condemn him to death and they will hand him over to the Gentiles to be mocked and flogged and crucified. On the third day, he will be raised to life. Jesus teaches about the last shall be first and the first shall be last and the sacrifice, but he also demonstrates it. And this is how he demonstrates it. He talks about what he will go through. That, that, that there is no greater example of the first being last and the last being first than Jesus willingly giving himself over to the powers that be. He gave himself over to Rome, and, and he could. I don't know who, if they understood who they were dealing with, but, but he could exert his power over Rome. I understand that Jesus was not helpless as he went about doing his work, the ministry in the world. Jesus tells his disciples that he's going to Jerusalem in order to pay the price for man's sinfulness. Jesus himself demonstrates the kingdom of God and shows that it is not of this world by telling them that the Son of Man will be delivered to the chief priests and the teachers of the law. Jesus himself gets into last place by getting up on Calvary's tree. We've got to understand, no one put Jesus on the tree. Jesus planned to get on that tree. That he was the one who demonstrated what does it look like to be in last place intentionally in order to bring glory to God, in order to expand the kingdom? Jesus does that with this, and he tells his disciples, this is what I will do. I'm hoping that they, they caught on to this, but it is so hard for us to catch on to the concept of being in last place and intentionally being in last place of deferring to another. But throughout the Bible, it's talked about what does it look like for the believer to be in last place. And, it, it, and Jesus is no greater, is the greatest example. Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 11. The apostle Paul writes to the church of Philippi. He says, talking about Jesus, in your late relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who... Being in very nature of God did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in, made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. We were just studying the book of Hebrews, right? Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2 tells believers, fix our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him endured the cross, 
scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God on high. Jesus himself demonstrates that it is okay, in fact, it is preferred that we as believers take the low road, that we take the last place, that we defer to someone else, that we sacrificially give ourselves to something else greater than us, the kingdom of God and God's purposes in our life. And what God will do, he will exalt us in due time. We will be rewarded. Sometimes we don't want to be in last place because it feels horrible, doesn't it? We don't want that. I can remember growing up, I was thinking this morning about I used to elementary school. And, and, and you know, I don't know if you guys remember, at recess time, you had to, when recess bell rang and it was time to go in. And they wanted you to, to rush into a line. And we were rushing to a line. I was at Whittier Elementary School, rushing to a line. And inevitably, there was someone who landed on the ground, scraped knee, busted lip, something, trying not to be in last place. Because we've always been taught that last place is not good, right, in this world. Don't disrespect me. Don't look down on me. I am somebody. I'm going to be somebody. But God says last place ain't so bad when it's about God's kingdom. It's not so bad when it's about his kingdom. But sometimes we got to learn that. And it's difficult to learn. How is it difficult? To, let's look at this passage. Look further down in verse number 20. I just want to read. It says, Then the mother of Zebedee, Zebedee's sons, came to Jesus with her sons, kneeling down and asked for a favor. Verse 21. What is it you want, he asked. He asked. She said, Grant that one of these two sons of mine may sit at your right hand and the other at your left hand in your kingdom. Jesus said, you don't know what you're asking. <laughs> Jesus said, can you drink the cup I'm going to drink? They said, we can. They answered. Jesus said to them, you will indeed drink from my cup. But to sit at my right or my left is not for me to grant. These places belong to those for whom they have been given, prepared by my father. When the ten heard about this, they were indignant with the two brothers. Jesus yeah. called them together and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lorded over them, and their high officials exercised authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you, listen, must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be your slave. But just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many, and so the kingdom of God is an opportunity to be great. And Jesus explains what great is all about. Here are these sons of Zebedee. These, this is James and John, a part of the disciples, the inner 12, like the 12, Jesus' disciples. And they, their mom, we'll call her for purposes of this morning, Mother Z. <laughs> or Mrs. Zebedee. She wanted to get her sons in a position of authority, knowing that Jesus was doing something unique and different. And so she advocated for her sons for a position of authority and prestige. And Jesus explained when, when, when she did that, he explained to his disciples that, that James and John were, were, were captive to the Gentile way of doing things, which was uh, they were prized for certain things uh, as a result. It was a political system. They were given power and status as a result of favors and, and inquiries. And, and, and Jesus says that James and John and Mom Z were under that influence. And, and that was a part of that was one of the reasons why. She went and advocated on behalf of her sons to Jesus. Say, can you give my babies a seat on the right and the left? I'm looking at all the moms in here. And that's just, that's just what moms do. And so I, I'm not going to come hard on Mom Z, but, but she did that. But there was a unique and distinctness about this, that, that, that this was, a, this was a, a characteristic of the world system, that it was about the political means that, that, to get ahead. And Jesus was talking about a different system. Jesus said, look, that's not mine to give, but to share in the cup. You're going to share in that cup. And, and James and John, James, uh, the brother of John, was crucified. And you'll see that in Acts chapter 4. He was, he was put to death, rather, in Acts chapter 4. And John spent the, the remainder of his life on the island of Patmos, where he wrote, he saw the vision for the book of uh, Revelation. 
And so he was he experienced some of that cup because the cup that Jesus was talking about in this passage was a cup of suffering. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's a cup of suffering. Yeah. Last place. Mm -hmm. Cup of suffering. Mm -hmm. and, and you're going to have to give up some stuff. See, that's what the kingdom is about. Yeah. Not about right and left hand in the kingdom and all these requests. It's about drinking that cup and experiencing what it means to follow Jesus in the world. We all have our cup that we experience as a, as a result of following Jesus. This is a sacrifice that God has all called us to make as a result of following Jesus. He says, you will drink in my cup, but the Father has to designate his position in the kingdom who will sit on the right and on the left. And, and, and this created issues and, and among the ten. And you'll see that there is strife when, when, when there are power grabs, when folks are about positional power and getting more power and more prestige, it brings up issues and conflicts. See, when our agenda disrupts his agenda, conflict happens. 24, when the 10 heard about this, they were digging with the two brothers. How, man, you know what? I can't believe these two cats. They got their mom. That's what we're doing. Your mom is going and talking to Jesus. Or your mom, you can't talk to Jesus and ask for these things yourself. You want to manipulate. That's the nature of the kingdom of this world. So dissension was introduced within this group. And I'm going to tell you something. James, uh, James 4.1 says, From whence come wars and fighting among you? Come they not in, even of your lusts that war in your members. You want to know where conflict comes from? Where issues come from while we're so divided? Man, it, it comes from stuff like this. We want more. We want prestige. But see, we have to understand that this is in direct contradiction to the kingdom of God. Last shall be first. First shall be last. Who wants to be great among you must be servant of all. They've got to be the first to open up, to close down. They've got to be the first to save, to see what others might need. they got to be the first to pray, the first to help out, the first to lend a hand. This is what the kingdom is all about. It's not about competition to get more power and prestige and a bigger name and a bigger brand. And Jesus lays that out. Jesus says, look, let me tell you something about the kingdom, that, that there can be ambition in life, but let me give you the instructions on, on how it actually works. You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them and their high officials exercise over them. He says in verse 26, pay attention to this, not so with you. Not so in the church, not so among believers. We ought not to lord anything over our brother and our sister. We ought to be loving and about God's work. Yeah. Instead, whoever wants to be great among you must be your servant. Yeah. Whoever wants to be great, brother, sister, how can I help you? Mm -hmm. right. What can we do for you? How can I serve you? That's a position of leadership, a position of influence, not sitting on the right or on the left. Man, our ambition in life must be directed to serve others. At Great Commission Church, why do we push so hard to meet the needs of others through ministry? Why are we about this business? Why so many ministries? Why so many attempts to meet needs that uh, uh, folks that come to our fellowship? It is because of what Jesus says. He says the first should be last and the last should be first. Who wants to be great among you must be your servant. How can we serve the West Upland community in a way that is relevant and contextual and consistent? Amen. That's the questions that we're asking. That's what our vision statement is about. That's what our mission statement is about. That's why we direct resources to, to do those things instead of getting a nicer place, a more plus accommodations. Yes. Because it's about those on the outside. Greatness in the kingdom is defined by going low and being the last. But the philosophy of this life goes contrary to that. What you hear on the street is kill or be killed, get or get gotten, selfishness. And we see this played out on the news day in and day out. 
because this world has a different philosophy and we've got this thing from Jesus about his kingdom and we're so quiet about it. I don't want them to know. I don't want them to know that there's a better way to live. That there's a better way to resolve problems. There's a better way of, of, of seeing uh, how, how we get positional authority, power in, in, in these things. There's a different way. I want to encourage you to be loud about the kingdom of God and about God's purposes, about God's priorities in this world. Be loud about it. Because we are the catalyst that changes. He said, just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Those are the instructions on how to live in this world. Those are the instructions on how to live this world. Without those instructions, our world goes haywire. Have you ever tried to put together IKEA furniture without instructions? Anybody? I have tried to put together IKEA furniture without instruction. It does not work. It, do, it don't work. You can never put this world together. This world will never find peace. Trying to resolve issues using the world system. You need instructions from God. The kingdom of God, lastly, verse 29 to 34. The kingdom of God is an opportunity to bless others. As, verse 29, as Jesus and his disciples were leaving Jericho, a large crowd followed him. Two blind men were sitting by the roadside, and when they heard that Jesus was going by, they shouted, Lord, son of David, have mercy on us. The crowd rebuked them and told them to be quiet, but they shouted all the louder, Lord, son of David, have mercy on us. Jesus stopped and called to them, what do you want me to do for you, he asked. Lord, they answered, we want our sight. Jesus had compassion on them and touched their eyes. Immediately they received their sight and followed him. And here we see there are opportunities to bless others in the kingdom of God. The crowd literally rebuked these two blind men crying out for help on behalf of themselves. See, these guys were broken. They were blind, but they were humble. Broken, blind, and humble. Man, many of us, and I wonder in the crowd when they told them to be quiet, because I wonder at one point that many of them believed that they had nothing to give to that person in need. They had no, they had no way to address the very issue that they were dealing with. And, and another reason perhaps may be is that, that we are constantly telling those who are marginalized, those who are on our skirts, to just shut up. Because we don't want to hear about these issues. Don't you see Jesus is here? We don't want to hear about your blindness. And we forget sometimes that the church is a place where these individuals can get a voice and a chance to be heard and healed. This is the very place where they need to be. But I love the fact that the Lord listens to the cries of the broken, the blind, and the humble. Especially when they are repeated. They cried out twice, Lord, help us. Jesus says to them, what do you want me to do for you? Amen. And I love the, the, the consistency and the urgency that these two blind men had because they had nothing to lose. There was nowhere else to go but to Jesus. And see, the challenge of the kingdom of God is that when we interact with people like that, that we are ready to bless them, that we are ready to show them mercy, the same mercy that we have received. And the challenge of the kingdom of God is serving people who cannot repay you or provide you any clout, any reputation, any financial gain. These two blind men couldn't work. They couldn't offer Jesus nothing. But Jesus gave them the very thing that they needed. And that was their sight. He made them whole. I love the fact that they were urgent about their prayer. And God is teaching me just this last week, this past couple of weeks, to be urgent about my prayer that if I'm facing an issue, why wouldn't I cry out to Jesus again and again and again? Lord, I know you might be busy with these others, 
but I'm going to cry out to you again and again and again. And I know folks don't understand around me why I'm crying out to you and, and the stuff I'm going through, but I'm going to cry out to you again and again and again. And Jesus sees and hears the broken, the blind, and the humble. Verse 34, Jesus had compassion. Jesus felt within himself a desire to extend mercy. This was a compassion, a deep inner feeling of compassion. He feels to them and he touched, he touched their eyes. And immediately they received their sight. And here's what they did also. They followed him. They followed him. They said, man, what, what else am I going to do? In his life. This man gave me back my life. He gave him my sight. I will do anything for him. See, when the kingdom of God comes near, it is so compelling. It is so uh, attractive. It is so desirous that, that folks want to run to the king of kings and the Lord of lords. Because he addresses right where we're at. Jesus stepped into their context, into their lives, and transitioned and changed them, made them whole. See, that's the kingdom of God. Each of these instances, Jesus shows mercy. Jesus shows mercy. If I were to ask you again, what would you prefer, God's mercy or fairness? You want the mercy. You, want the mercy. you don't want that. You don't want that fairness. You don't want that justice. Because all we need is just this morning. All we need is a videotape playback of this morning. Let me see. Oh, you, you sure you want? You want that fairness? Because you've been such a good girl and boy, huh? Yeah? Hey, Santa Claus. So you can pull a wall over Santa Claus' eyes, but not Jesus. You know, tell him that you've been good and, and all that, but but Jesus. Man, I, I just encouraged by, by, by these words, and I hope that you sense that, that God is a God of mercy. As we go through this season of Advent, and you think about God coming close. We think about Jesus coming from heaven to earth, putting on flesh, living among sinful men and women, ultimately going to the cross and dying for us. It is the ultimate act of mercy on our behalf. It is the ultimate act of love on our behalf that we may be healed, that we may be made whole. And here's the reality. Those who are blessed get a chance to bless others. We get a chance to be light and, and something to someone else. Don't miss that. It's not a, a hallmark theme. We think, man, just doing good enough. That's something that Disney came up with. That's something that hallmark came up with. No, that's the kingdom of God. Amen. To serve. Stop looking to be served. Amen. Bow your heads. Father, Lord, we thank you for your, your word this morning. God, I pray that your word will sink deep into our hearts and our minds. Father, I thank you, Lord God, for giving us an opportunity to work in your vineyard. Giving us an opportunity to be a part of your kingdom. Lord, I thank you that Jesus came from heaven to earth and put himself up as a ransom for many. Lord, I thank you, God, that you're not impressed by those who seek positions of authority, those who seek prestige, those who seek to improve their, their branding and, and all that, Father God. You're not impressed by that, God. You've called us to be serving God. Thank you, Lord God, for hearing the broken, the blind, and the humble. And as those who have been broken and those who are blind and humble, God, we cry out to you for your mercy. We thank you for your mercy, Father God. And our desire is to bless others. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Candy, for that encouraging word. So we praise God for an opportunity to hear from him this morning. With every head bowed and with every eye closed, we want to offer an opportunity to that person who may be here who does not know the Lord. As Pastor Candy has said, we didn't come to be served, but to serve. To know what the Lord has done for us, to know what the Lord has done on our behalf because of the life of sin that we all have lived. If you are here in this sanctuary, if you are watching online and you are 
blind, you are broken, and you are humble, you recognize that you need the Lord today. To just think about all that the Lord has been doing for you, you find yourself recognizing that you struggled so much in your life, but the Lord is here to deliver you today. The Lord is reaching out to you. The Lord is calling out to you, saying, what do you want me to do? He will save you today. If you recognize that you are in need of a Savior, won't you repeat this prayer after me? I am a sinner and deserve the punishment for my sin. I believe that Jesus paid the penalty for my sin. I ask for God's forgiveness. I will follow Jesus and I will confess him as my Lord and Savior. I receive the free gift of salvation today in Jesus Christ. If you prayed that prayer, won't you raise your hand? Someone here in the sanctuary will come and talk with you. We will continue to pray with you, be with you, teach you what it means to be a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. If you are watching online and you pray that prayer, won't you please text us at 267-991-8907. Again, if you've watched online and you've prayed that prayer, Text us at 267-991-8907. Someone from Great Commission Church will be in touch with you. And we will walk alongside you to help you to mature as a believer. That's what we do here. Because we believe that it is our job to be on mission. Amen? Amen. For those who probably have found themselves at times being like Mama Z, as Pastor Candy said, trying to position ourselves, trying to figure out what it is that we can do to sort of gain accolades or, or likes or, or to gain some sort of prestige. As we talk about living for the Lord, it's not about that. You know you need the Lord's strength, the Lord's power, the Lord's spirit to begin doing what it is that he's called you to do. We can pray right now. Let's look to the Lord. Father, we thank you for all that you have continued to do in our lives. We thank you for your word, how it pierces our hearts, for how it transforms our minds. We ask, Lord, that you would just help us, God. We repent of those things where sometimes we think it's more about us and not about you. We ask, God, that you would just continue to lead us and guide us into all truth and understanding. Lord, enlighten us through your word, God. Illuminate our hearts. Lord, show up those dark spots in our soul, God, in our spirit, those things that are not like you. Lord, remove them from our lives. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.